It's eight o'clock in Amsterdam. It's eight o'clock in the evening. Our latest show ever. Yeah. It's like we're we're turning into the late show. The late show with Bambos and Andy. <laughs> so today we've got Matthew Schwartz on. Yeah. Matthew Schwartz. I call him an icon. I don't think he likes to be referred to as an icon, but he's done this for four damn decades at 10,000 shows. Like, I think you've deserved the right to refer to yourself as an icon if you've gone through all of that. So today on the show, we've got Matthew Schwartz with his new book, Confessions of an Investigative Reporter on A Wonderful, Wonderful Chaos. Chaos. that jingle hey andy hey bambos we, 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 i literally just arrived here so we didn't even get to say how are you doing today, yes, this evening i'm doing well this evening i went to the amsterdam zoo for the first time in 15 years i saw the pictures i was yes. like they let you in yeah they let us in you know they give you little passes now you go and you stay a meter and a half apart from each other it's all very regulated one direction so um you know it's a staycation now that you are forced to stay in one location for an extended period of time, you do stuff you would otherwise not have ne never do. Did you walk there? No, I took the moped. Okay. But I did 10,000 steps. My vibrating wristband let me know that I did the right amount of steps when I was there. So today we've got on Matthew Schwartz. Mm. And Bambos noted that he said, Andy doesn't usually take notes, which I did. And I felt like it was important to take these notes because Matthew is an investigative journalist. So he... You know, he prepares himself before he does interviews, I'm assuming. Little did he know coming on this show that we've never prepared for a show pretty much before anyone's ever shown up. Yeah. So this is new for us. But why not? Well, he prepared. I, I just <laughs> came. <laughs> I, I just want to meet him where he is. But uh... Well, we might not even talk about anything I've written about. But let's just say I prepared. And I love it. Yes. And so I found Matthew. We spoke because Matthew also has the same Pub uh, publisher as I do, Kohler Books. So is, is that how you met him? Yeah, we met okay. because he's going to Kohler Books, and we discussed, and we we're both going. And we, I found him actually on um, on the internet before he signed with Kohler, and I don't know why it just popped up in my feed. And it was interesting because even before we spoke, I found it quite curious what he was writing about, and it kind of sweet because in some ways, I mean, there's an aspect of when someone starts to get to an age when they're hitting retirement, you start thinking, I'm going to write my memoir. I'm like, I want the world to sort of, I want my kids to see that, you know, what I've done all those years that they, I wasn't at home. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so basically I find it really beautiful that that process was going on. And then he kind of shared of these stories, like some of these 10,000, which, you know, and I've always been fascinated by these reporters that shove microphones in, in, in like lousy people's uh, faces, you know, like it's, and, and it's sort of like my greatest fear, right? You know, like as a kid, like I had a hard time asking a girl out because I just was scared, frightened that I might be rejected. You know, I wasn't, I didn't have the strength you do, Bambos, you know. But weirdly, a similar fear would be calling somebody out for something that they were doing that was wrong mm. and knowing that the repercussions could come back to you. I mean, that's, that's, and think about doing that on a daily basis. Living on the edge. <laughs> he likes I mean, living on the edge. Yes, you can imagine living on the edge and you can also imagine that like how many people wanted to kill him? Because there's, I can guarantee you, if you expose them on national TV, that doesn't go over well. Yeah. So basically, that's and, and this is all written about in his book, which you can see in, behind us right now. We even have his name pa plastered across Matthew Schwartz, um, and we're going to bring him on. I uh, I read a third of the book, so I got through a third. I in fact. The part I really enjoyed was the beginning where we could dig into mommy daddy issues and stuff. So I think I got more in that first two chapters <laughs> than I needed in the other chapters, quite honestly. But let's bring him on right now and let's uh, let's bring Matthew Matthew Swartz on. Hello. Hello, Welcome. guys. We, we've got our first comment from Ron Vargas, who's also going to be on a show. He says that you owe him money just to make sure <laughs> Ron. We got Ron out really quickly. We have him on a show in a few weeks, which is about uh, living without filters because he doesn't have any problem saying things. So I assume you guys are pretty similar in that regard. I All don't right? remember the name. Ron will have to refresh my memory. <laughs> when was the year? Um, I, I think Ron has that kind of sense of humor. Right? He has the worst sense of humor you can imagine. So we're, we, we're putting well, a lot of... My book. 
We're putting, yes, Ron, please buy the book, Confessions of an Investigative Reporter. So I uh, brought, I, I actually called you an icon and I heard that you said, Andy, I don't necessarily feel myself to be an icon. Uh -huh. how, how is that for you? There's, a, there's only a few icons in broadcasting. You know, Morrow, Cronkite, you know, I think Leslie Stahl, Mike yeah. Wallace. I don't, yeah, I'm not in their league. I'm just a little local reporter who, for, you know, a bunch of years, tried to help the community I worked in. Yeah, but I mean, like, truth be told, like, it's probably harder to do your work because you're street fighting. They're like in an ivory ca castle. It's kind of easy to do their reporting where you're basically going up to some idiot on the street who's ripping people off and throwing a mic in their face and exposing them. I mean, that had to be scary at times. I was scared a few times. I write about it in the book. You know, when, when the uh, bodyguard slash father of a illegal fortune teller came up to me, ran at me swinging a baseball bat. That was, that was kind of scary. And when you, and when you, and so, and, and he, he swung with the intent to hit or to, to threaten? Oh, no, no, to hit, to hit. We backed off. I actually stayed there. This is how sick reporters can be. I really wanted the video that I actually didn't even run away at first. I, actually, <laughs> was like, I wanted like, to stay close to him and I wanted it to last long enough so my photog will get the shot. That's kind of sick. If it bleeds, it leaves. Oh, this is great video. <laughs> Yeah, oh. so then I backed oh. off because I didn't want to. I didn't either want want to want to bleed, but they didn't stay in that area and rip off more, uh, you know, innocent women anymore. Yeah, so. I mean, a lot of people you would have exposed would have gone to jail. I'm assuming. Oh, many in the book have gone to jail, or and with, for it, more than a year to prison. Several in the book, con artists that I write about, who we yeah. followed all the way through to the trial. And do you believe that if you weren't doing your work, that they would have gone to jail? Or you think they would have been able to skate over it like that, like you raised the exposure of it? Well, the thing is, if you stay on top, if you think somebody is ripping off people, innocent people, and you stay on top of it, it you become such a thorn in the side, a pain in the neck to the attorney generals and prosecutors that they say, you know, they're making us look bad. We're not indicting this person. We're not charging them. And, you know. The state TV reporter keeps doing stories. They look bad. Like, you know, if the story becomes at some point, why are they in business? Yeah. Mm. So to answer your question, I mean, you know, not to take credit, but all reporters, all investigative reporters and general assignment reporters who do stay on the back of, the, of law enforcement when they have the goods in somebody and the documents. Yeah, I think it helps to bring them to justice. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, Matthew, do you... Do you work with informants? Like, how do you go about to find a story like that? Like, I get tips. I, I get tips from um, informants, sources, you know, anonymous phone calls. Sometimes people who, who you know, just contact all the media, not just me. Uh, but I have, you know, cultivated my own sources over the years. It's the first thing, I, first thing I do whenever I have gotten a new job. I've only had, I've worked in seven markets. Uh, but half of my career was spent at one station in New York City. So I haven't moved around that much, relatively speaking. The first thing I do is I contact all the newsmakers in that town. I read about the town. Lawyers are great con are great sources. Mm. They want to, you know, publicize their own cases. So I contact them. I introduce myself and, uh, you know, maybe get a coffee with them and tell them, you know, play up to their ego. They like that, right? So you, yeah. you, you try you try to befriend the the... the the powers that be in a town. And then mm. after a while, it, it takes a while really to establish, to get continuity for people to notice you and say, mm -hmm. oh, that's the, that's the investigative reporter I want to work with. Mm. Did people recognize you? Were you on enough that people got to know you and when you were in Tucson or wherever, like in New York, would they well, say, I'm oh. Still, I've been working now in Tucson since April of 13. And I was 20 years at one station in New York City. So yeah, you know, you get that. Yeah. Mm. Nice. I had a lot of questions about like in the, I mentioned, I really enjoyed the first chapters. In fact, in some ways I wanted the first chapters to go longer because uh, when you spoke about your mom and your dad and like even changing your name to get into like ha be less Jewish or whatever the thing you were trying uh -huh. to make your more, more appealing. It's like, like how was it for you to sort of then say, okay, I've got to like change my name and my image in order to find the, get like more appeal in this marketplace. Well, 
I was using Schwartz when I started. I never thought of it, of changing my name. And then at some point, my father back in the forties and fifties was on the fringe of, you know, the music business. He was in a little trio and he used Shaw and I liked Shaw, S H A W. Mm -hmm. So, but if I felt like I was ashamed of my Judaism or something. And so I, but when I went to Cleveland, I suggested this. I, I wasn't told to do this. I volunteered this to my news director in Cleveland, my third job. Mm -hmm. I worked in Utica, Richmond, and then Cleveland, two years each. And I said, what do you think about that? He said, fine. And then I got hired two years later in New York City, where I have a lot of friends. Went to, you know, grew up there, high school. And I said, you know what? I'm going to go back to Schwartz, and especially in New York, where ethnicity, you know, so yeah. diverse. So, and I've been that Schwartz ever since, but it was a little, I think it was probably a little being ashamed and because yeah. the anti, the anti-Semitism in the forties and fifties that my father had to deal with, you know, nothing like, especially even Cleveland in the, this was in the early eighties. Yeah. When you, uh, when you wrote, I mean, going down that same path and this is what I thought was quite beautiful when you wrote about your mom there and you said, you know, walking home that you were called dirty Jew and that she went and went to the house of the individual who actually said that to you. It did not you not knowing what transpired, only knowing that after that it never happened again. Yeah, she was a fighter. She was a real fighter. She was uh, an amazing person. I know a lot of everybody says that about their parents, but she was something else. Um, you know, very re reinvented herself many times. Became a, a, a nurse after her first husband was killed in in the war. And, uh, you know, raised my sister by herself for seven years till she met my father. And, uh, yeah, this was at seven years old when I was called that by a, a kid, uh, in my hometown. And, uh, I didn't want her to do anything, but you saw in the book what happened. And I think, um, some of her traits thankfully were passed down to me. Yeah. I would say, cause if you think about it, the strength of someone to say, Hey, um, that's not acceptable and we're going to deal with this. I mean, it, to some degree, that's something you've done from, from your life only through your work. That, that is you now. That's what an investigator reporter is all about. You know, we're supposed to afflict the afflicted, give voice to the voiceless, you know, hold the powerful accountable. And I think I got just about all of those traits from my mother who always fought for the underdog, stuck up for anybody she saw being bullied, mm. um, you know, a sense of justice from my mother. Uh, and I've tried to live my life that way and do all my stories uh, to hold the powerful accountable and stick up for victims. I mean, the best thing I hear is thanks what you do for the community. When people mm -hmm. come up to me when I'm out, um, there's a story in the book about a slumlord, I, I would say in Tucson that didn't fix these, uh, this large apartment building for seven months. And we did the story and in 24 hours, they found 24 federal, you know, HUD violations. It was subsidized housing. Mm. And, and they wow. and they found 24 violations. And within 24 hours of us doing the story, they fixed every single one. And wow. then we did a, we did a follow up to say that we went to the city after we went to the apartments that had all these just disgusting problems. I mean, gross stuff, all kinds of things. And uh, so that makes you feel good. And, and that's mm. the perfect story for me. I mean, I did so many stories where it just is gratifying. You know, people have thanked me, um, mm. affected, affected their lives and made them better. That's why we do this. Yeah. Matthew, um, it, it really feels like you're living and breathing this, this work, huh? It's like a craft. Do, do yeah. you like, do you, when you're home with your, uh, you're married, right? Or I assume you're married. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, does I, that, I, I say, I say she's my partner. She, okay. She's, she's your partner. Do do you switch off that button when you're home, or or does part of your of that investigative reporter creep into mm. the relationship? Not into the relationship, but sometimes I take the job home if I'm involved in a really complicated story. Yeah, mm. and you know, I get I get tips and emails and phone calls and texts from people at all hours, and I you know don't like to turn them away. Mm. Yeah. Have you so, ever, have you ever gotten a tip like that was a very dishonest tip that you sort of didn't figure out was dishonest till some way down the road because you just didn't know enough? Well, not before the story aired because I also check out the tipsters. 
Yeah. Okay. Oh, good. <laughs> you look at that smile. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, I could yeah. imagine there's a lot of people that want to throw other people under the bus. So they just call you and say, hey, this guy is doing something, but actually it isn't really what they're doing. It's just what they're hoping to, you know, create trouble for them or something. Well, you, you get a lot of tips from disgruntled, you know, ex-employees who are fired. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I've done stories with people who are fired, but if I found out that I checked it out with other employees, um, you know, just because they were fired doesn't mean they were a bad employee. Maybe they got a raw deal by the by the boss. You yeah. Know? Mm. Um, we did a story on a moving company here. We actually we did 13 stories on a moving company here called Three Gorillas Moving and Storage. Uh huh. And we got a ton of complaints about them. And then after the this happens a lot, you guys. After you do a story on a business or any story it prompts more that they didn't know you're working on. It prompts more calls and emails saying, hey, wait oh, a minute, yeah. I got something for you. Or you just struck the tip of the iceberg. So then we get more stories. And one of the guys that saw my first piece on this movie company was a former employee. And he showed me uh. his pay stubs and everything. And he had some really good inside information that all proved accurate. Cause I checked it out with other people. Wow. And he expounded, he expounded what I reported, but he basically said, it's even worse than you think. You know, they, they were, they were, they weren't, you know, it's an old trick by some, not all, moving companies where once your stuff is on the truck, all of a sudden the estimate is, you know, four times than what it was when they came to the yep. house because they're not bound by that in yep. many states. In many states. So they hold your stuff hostage. Hey, wait a minute. You know, what are you going to do? Not pay them and then lose all your furniture? Yeah. That's pretty common. Uh, that's one of the most complained about businesses that I've ever reported on. Moving wow. Companies because the lawmakers in too many states... Well haven't haven't done anything enough about it you know moving companies yeah. who would have thought that was the that was the achilles heel of the of yeah. the investigative reporting yeah. don't have an investigative reporter around if you're going to be a moving company andy yes what do you think matthew's guiding principle in his life is based on you know i thought when i read his book i had this impression that he had a hypersensitive sense of like right right or wrong Almost to his detriment, actually, if I have to like be honest. Mm. Yeah, like almost to the point, not that not that he wanted to do wrong per se, but almost like I'll give you an example. Like there's two spelling errors in his new book. And those two spelling errors are like the bane of his frustration at this pr present moment. <laughs> like, I brought well one 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 is actually a character error. I was supposed to say her son and it says her brother. And then I use the phrase Bombas rode his coattails and I spelled I didn't think I did this. I'm going to blame the editor, but whatever. I, I said he rode his coattails and I meant, obviously it's R O D E and it came out like street R O A D. And oh. that can't be changed. That can't be changed until like June 23rd because of the listings on, on online retailers. It'll mess up the listings. I know I tried it's, to, it's, it's OCD, right? It, it's those OCD. I, I told Bombo, I, I was yeah. basically, I told, I told Matthew before I said, there could be 10 errors in mine. If in general people are liking the book, then I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> hey, does yeah. this bother you guys when you're reading a book and there's like three extra spaces or even two between words? Y yes. All the time. All the time. <laughs> like I I've got, I don't think my book has it. I've got one person, only one person in my life. I'm not going to name him on air. But he always double spaces after periods in, in the emails. And then he wants me to correct and send them back to him. So now in order for me to correct, I need a double space after the period. And it's the most aggravating. So the first thing I do is I kind of wash it down to one spacing. Otherwise, I can't I can't get the mental right, comfort of right. doing it. it. And it isn't me. <laughs> no, it is not you. It is not. I've got another question for you that's a random question. I know we're not getting into the meaty stuff. But like you got the toupee, like how was it to wear the toupee for, for yeah. even if the short time you had it? Yeah, I had one in about. You know what toupee 90s. is? Yeah. I write a lot of things I think about, about you know, self-deprecating and personal failings in the book. Otherwise, why call it confessions if you're not going to be honest and open? Yeah, I thought it was great. Well, as you can see, my hair is thinning, but it was, I thought. I was going to go bald when I was in my early to mid forties, like my father did at that age. And fortunately it didn't go completely bald, just the huge forehead. So I bought it to, I had a toupee. I thought it was, you know, really good. And I'm at work like five minutes and this guy goes, you did something different to your hair. And I'm like, Oh, great. But then I write, I don't know why I got one. It was a 
insecurity thing, I guess, you know, TV and the pressure. Yeah. Uh, Cause I write in the book. I can always tell when some guy has a toupee on, <laughs> I can always tell it's detectable, you know, I said, yeah. I'll never get one. And I got one and I threw it in the trash a year or two later. Wow. And I mean, uh, so, so it was because in that industry, you felt like you need to present because you'll often be deprecating in the book and talk about yourself being Jewish and fat and not necessarily with your voice and all this. So in some ways, oh, it yeah, never lousy TV voice. Yeah, it, yeah, it, 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 right. it sounded like you never really like owned that you had actually the makeup of you was actually perfect for what it was you were doing. It was almost like you were judging it like as if Walter Cronkite was the standard for someone who's shoving a microphone in people's faces and saying, stop being an asshole. You know, like somehow your personality was perfect for it, as far as I could see. Well, you know, I, I didn't want to get hung up on it, but I did say, you know, I wasn't the best, greatest on camera presence. I got a nasally voice, a New York accent. There were other people, so many people I know whose voice I die for. I started an all news radio. They all had unbelievable, you know, voices. And uh, I said, you know, I'm going to outwork people. That's what I'll have to do, you know? Yeah. It's like it's like the athlete that doesn't have great God given talent or natural ability that he works harder. People. And I said, you know, I'm going to work harder. And uh, I, I, you know, I'm just pretty happy with how things have been going. Well, you've done it for four decades. So that's certainly I'm sure you outlasted most of them for doing it for 40 years. I had right. a good run. You know, people are always laid off in the business and I never got laid off or not renewed my contract oh, nice. technically until I was in my until I hit 50. Wow. That, Matthew, that happened twice in five years. Wow. Matthew, um, yes. what did you have to sacrifice to deliver that high standard of quality work mm. in your life? Well, I had to move to three places I had never lived in. Like all reporters, you know, you got to move up. So I went in the minor leagues of television. I worked in Utica, Richmond, and Cleveland. My dream was to work in New York City by my 30th birthday. My first day was my 30th birthday. So I didn't see it, Bombas, as a sacrifice. I saw it as something I have to do to get to New York. Do yeah. the minor do the minor league. So I did six years, two in each of those three cities, Utica, Richmond, Cleveland. Um, you know, you, you know the deal is long hours. You know that going in. So I don't look at it as a, a, a hardship. Was it a sacrifice? Maybe. Uh, I will say later on that my job in New York City, uh, it was my fault. I got divorced. It was my fault because I was paying so much attention to the job and my kids that I kind of left my ex-wife, then wife, out of the equation. Mm. You know, I was just I was either with the, the kids or work. I was very involved in my two sons' sports activities. Mm -hmm. and it helped them i think contributed to their success in sports they're great athletes but you know they both got college scholarships and one of them ended up getting drafted in 2010 by the chicago white Sox major league team and played in the minor leagues for mm -hmm. several years so mm -hmm. you know but i think i did not pay enough attention to my marital relationship so that mm -hmm. was to answer your question I, that's probably the big sacrifice of cost yep. if you will of my career totally right. my total, mm. totally my fault that i yeah. was so into the job yeah. i mean the especially new york city i mean the first 10 years i wasn't an investigative reporter i was a general assignment reporter and that's really you know it was stressful very very I, stressful I, I actually thought you were going to say i didn't have a social life i wasn't eating good i was sleeping well, I, very I, I little wasn't eating good i wasn't eating good but, but you know we it was all we had three kids in five years because I didn't get married till I was almost 33 years old. And that's what mm. we wanted to do. Mm. But it was really revolving around the kids activities. Wow. So we send out an apology. All my, all my free time when I wasn't working all my yeah. free time when I wasn't working, you know, by the time I got home at night, I was exhausted. Like we send know, out an apology to your ex-wife. There are a lot of this is a public apology. What was her name? There, there are a lot of general assignments. <laughs> <laughs> She's waited all these years for you to apologize. Yeah. Should we put the microphone in his face lot. and yeah. <laughs> start interrogating him? <laughs> By the way, my uh, 
laptop here juice is down to 19 percent. i'm getting nervous here. well you, we're, we, we've got another 35 no. minutes if it goes off don't worry we can talk about you for half an hour at least we'll celebrate oh, yeah. you we'll celebrate you without your presence I might um, try to uh, try to another one and see if we can I get like the juice the, going back. Yeah, you can do yeah. that. We'll talk about you. you if you hear us, you hear us. If you don't, it's fine. We, no, you know, still, okay. <laughs> I am. Um, I love that even in the book, you were precise about the income you were earning. So, like, you even pretty much you you laid bare your entire life to some regards. Like, this is what a person in my role would e actually be earning. Yeah. That we don't, we'll leave that for hope the book readers. But, Obviously, but I'm not going to give numbers. I know, but, I, I know. but what did you think of that, by the way? I said my exact salary in New York City. I said my exact car payment. I thought, hey, if I'm going to confess to things. Yeah. Uh, and he, in fact, I added the divorce in the second version uh, because I thought, well, what happened to the marriage? Because in the in the forward, the mm. wonderful writer and reporter, Mike Taibbi from Dateline NBC, references my faltering relationship i know he did and then i didn't have it in the first book and i said that's not right readers might say well what is he talking about in the forward so i mm -hmm. i made sure that we added that um about the divorce what did you think of those personal revelations by the way i liked it i mean to be honest with you that's i wanted more of those as i read past it because i'm more of this person who likes the human thing i want to see you and understand you so when you wrote your mom and you wrote that she died in 1989 and that you she was buried in her uniform or israeli combat uniform i mean that was kind of like those little details i found to be really beautiful just to kind of give a context for how you were raised and what was important you know that's what i found nice so yeah you know, my, my book uh, that I told you about earlier before we got on was basically 240 page confession. You know, I, I, I wrote everything. You know, it, yeah, it's it's funny you say that because before this book was bought and that's an interesting story if you want to get into that later. But um, when I thought I was going to self publish it because I'm not in this to make money or a lot of money or have a bestseller. OK, I fully expected to pay like three to four thousand dollars and self publish. But somebody bought the book. We can get into that later. But the first guy that read the book, a really accomplished editor, said, I love the, the confessions. Do more personal stuff. Mm. You know? So I added more. Yeah. They're, they're kind of they're interwoven throughout the book, but especially early on, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that's what but gets me to... interested. Like the story that you said, one of the stories that you said, which sort of like threw me back was really like, oh no, I would never feel comfortable with what you did was when yeah. you were in, um, when you were in, uh, college at Ohio university and there were the football players going to the away games and they were smoking pot on the bus going to those games. Now the Correct. fact, the fact that you wrote about that story, even though those roommates were there and published it in the, in the paper, I mean, you were like, like you, you set your life up for this. Like who the hell? And that were the word that one would use in in college for such an activity would, we would say you ratted them out, but you, at what age were you? You were 19 years old at that time, 20. That was, I, I think I was 21. It was my senior year. Those football players, three of them were my roommates <laughs> in a house. Jesus Christ. I mean, who just hey if you're on hey if you're on a college scholarship you shouldn't be smoking weed i know smoking weed now you know obviously legal in so many states but if you're smoking uh, med you know medicinally if you're smoking weed and you're on a full scholarship do it on your own time okay but we're not don't, talking don't about do that it, don't do we're, it on, don't do it on the way to a football game you're getting paid to go to college basically you know i, I just think but we're place, not judging wrong place in time and this okay. is by the way 1970 wow seven oh I wow graduated in 76 this was no this was mm. 76 mm. spring of my senior year i mean so come let's on. you have to get high but, get but let's get clear time. there's no judgment of you doing it there yeah. is the other respect that you would have the strength and the, I, I know you take it for right, granted. Right, right. You take it for right, granted. Right. But look, I am one of these people that was like in need of social validation. Like I would not do stuff so that I wouldn't be disliked. 
you actively did something that would certainly make you disliked. You were inviting it. You're like, and you stayed in the same room with them. <laughs> and you stayed in the same room as them. I mean, you were born for this yeah. work. Who else well, would do something like it, that? You have to have a thick skin, and it's not a popularity contest. If you think it's a story, it's a story. Um, yeah. What really made, made me feel good about that, and I mentioned this in the book, is that uh, all over campus, I heard because Ohio U has a wonderful and large journalism school. I heard they were talking about the piece in in the paper that I did with the sports editor. It was co co byline, and that made me feel good that they validate that you know that these mm. I was 22, 21, and that these journalism professors validated it and said that's a good example of investigative reporting. Yeah, so I'm sure. I looked over my shoulder. I you mentioned in the have. book. I looked over my shoulder walking around campus a lot. I I, I was afraid they would use me for a tackling dog. <laughs> I would be afraid of it for sure. You actually interviewed Trump a few times. Yes, about before, this was in the um, 90s when he, uh, you know, in Trump Tower, when um, assignment editors would send reporters to interview him on subjects often not even related to. <laughs> he just liked the uh, camera, as we know. Real estate development business. How was it for you to. It was what, always what a really good sound bite. Okay. And what impression did you have of him when you were when you were interviewing him then? Well, he liked giving interviews. I noticed when I interviewed him in the lobby of Trump Tower. First of all, in the six or seven interviews I did with him, well, one was a press conference, but the other ones, I was only in his office that I can remember two times, four or five other times they were in the lobby. And I think he liked doing it in the lobby of this Trump Tower crowded with workers Mm, and mm -hmm. residents, shoppers, because I think he liked being seen and he liked doing that. And I noticed during the interviews, uh, he would look around a lot at the crowd. He'd look around a lot at the people. Uh, yeah. But he enjoyed it. But, you know, he spoke in sound bites. So TV assignment editors loved that. Uh -huh. uh, not not saying whether you agree or disagree with his politics. They just say he's a great sound bite. Yeah. A lot, of time, a lot of times I didn't know why are we going to interview a real estate developer about something in the city that has nothing to do with real estate. Yeah, I including thought, I, I thought he might run for mayor of New York one day. Yeah. I never thought he'd run for president. Especially the Central Park Five story, because that actually has its own sort of Netflix series around it right now. Him and how he instigated the murder of the innocent the kids that were found to be innocent later. Yeah. You mean you know you, know, you mean you mean that he, he said that they should uh, receive the death penalty when yes. it first happened when it yeah. first happened. And yeah, exactly. Then were, and then a guy in prison confesses and they find a DNA match much later and they release the five guys from prison mm, yeah. who, who always proclaim their innocence, the Central Park Five, and then um, they win something like a $41 million lawsuit yeah. from would the you, city after they all spent years um, in prison. When you were, because you would have been around during that time and during that story. Well, I was working in New York then. I covered that. I was at the Trump press conference when he had put that morning in four newspapers in New York City ads calling for the death penalty. And he thought Ed Koch, the three-term mayor, was, 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 was weak on crime. And, that it, you know, he, he really was furious about it. And then he had the press conference and he said mm. what, he, what he said in the newspaper ad. But then many years later when their innocence was proven and he was asked about it he didn't say you know that he regretted what he said yeah. at the time and that he was wrong yeah he hasn't so, done that since anything in his life i don't think so that wouldn't be any different yeah <laughs> um i've got a you know there were a few things that came also up for me that i thought were really quite fascinating um it goes back to your question of my impression that I took away from the book of Matthew when I read it. So there was this one instance, of course, your probably biggest interview you'd ever done was with Berkowitz, son of Sam Killer, the serial killer. I think he killed six women. He keeps mentioning that in every... every part. Yeah, because that's yeah. the biggest one he did. So it sounds most most notable. Go on. So the question is, is that in your... In, in, you know, you mentioned in the book that you basically the the what would we say the person above you that's uh, guiding your stories your 
What would that person? News, news, news director. The news director sort of asked you to make this David David appear to be worse than he actually was, be, or f- you to be more fearful than you actually were by saying that there was a pen in front of you that you were scared to have there because you thought he could take it any moment and kill you. Yes, that's and what so, happened. And so it's interesting. So my question to you is like nine times out of 10, I'm guessing that if a director said to somebody, hey, listen, let's add this to the story because it'll make it sound a little bit more exciting. So uh, would you say that in the news industry that most people would say, no, that wasn't what it was? Or do you think they'd say, yes, let's add it. It sounds better. I think most people would say, no, don't lie. Really? Would they? Never, never happened. Okay. I fought it and and I go in depth on this in the book. And I, I, and then he told me, um, I, I, I wrote his, I thought he was kidding. He said, weren't you, my pen was between Berkowitz and myself. He said, weren't you worried you'd pick up the pen and stab you with it? And then I say in the book about why I wasn't nervous about Berkowitz now, 25 years later, this interview was in May of 2002. And then I come back to my news director, he reads the script and he changes it saying, uh, he had the line he wanted me to say was that I was afraid that Berkowitz would pick up the pen and stab me with it. He changed it to, my producer was worried that Berkowitz would pick up my pen and stab me with it. Yeah. Well, Mm -hmm. guess, guess what guys, my producer was not at the interview and he was not even in the newsroom. He was off that day because his wife wife was getting ready to give birth to their first child. I fought this. See, I didn't have it in the script that I came back to him with after the first time he suggested it. Yeah. And um, I I brought it back to the to my news director the script without that name, without that line in it, and he said change it to my producer. So okay. I, I called my producer when I was writing the book because I, I remember who was at the interview. I had two photographers with me and it was myself. That was it. And I said to my producer, Ethan, will you, you weren't at the interview, right? I mean, I was sure, but I wanted to for my own head. He goes, of course. No, I definitely wasn't. So, so, so you, know, you would that say. That was a lie. That was yeah. a lie on TV and I made it. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I hate that it happened, but I couldn't quit i couldn't afford to quit i had three young kids and my wife and a big mortgage and that's the truth so that but, that was fake that was fake news it was forced upon me i couldn't quit if i could have quit i would have and, and what know, i'm my but, dream job financially i couldn't you know what am i supposed you to do? say like nowadays everyone talks about fake news and you're what you've just stated shows the level of integrity that you're endeavoring to bring to a story do you believe that that level of integrity is in the news today or do you feel like there's a lot of people saying that there are pens Mm -hmm. that they're afraid of that they're not really afraid of just to make the news more exciting i think this is an unusual case that happened to me 18 years ago i think most reporters everybody has political biases i think most reporters try their best to be very fair i mean in our editorial meetings Mm -hmm. in my current job and every place i've worked we discuss how do we get both sides? We discuss the elements. And by the mm-hmm. way, one of our viewers, Josina Denberger, thank you. It was pretty tense. Um, but I talk about it a lot in the book, but thank you for your comment. When, I appreciate it. Just when you look at w- get into that comment, when you look at him in the eyes, right? When you yes. look at them in the eyes, are you like feeling the intensity or are you so removed from that? Cause you're sort of just have to get to an interview. Like, and I just want to tell your viewers before I answer that, Josina's comment was, must be very tense to speak with a real evil person, even when he was in jail. The tenseness was from not forgetting to ask all the questions I want to ask, because he didn't give a lot of interviews. OK. Um, and I write in the book about what the whole background of how we got this interview. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll tell you what, it felt a little weird to shake his hand, just knowing that he held a gun in the hand that shot, you know, 13 people. And mm. killing six of them um that was that was weird but you know i thought it's not going to get the interview off to a good start if i don't shake his hand when he sticks his hand out yeah now, he had be, he had become a um, jew for jesus he was born again this was 25 years after he was in prison okay and he had a he had a parole hearing coming up by law in new york you get a parole hearing 
It was just a, a mere, you know, perfunctory thing, a, a legal thing. He wasn't going to get out of prison. He had six life sentences. Okay. So mm. um, it was a little strange. Yes. I've sat down with some other, you know, criminals, including a serial, uh, a serial killer in New Jersey. But, uh, you know, I was just a little, a little nervous to that. I asked every question that needed to be asked. Mm -hmm. I thought it was also, I saw that you went to the father of, of one of the victims. And I mean, that must have been kind of strange because on one level, when you looked at him in the interview, he seemed like he was a quite soft spoken, you know, and you speak about it in the, and you write about it as well. Was that, you know, if you'd just met him on the street, you'd think that he was just a normal guy. Berkowitz? Yeah. Yeah. He looked like a lot of guys I saw on the street in New York at that yeah. point, you know? I write that he was 40, he was, uh, I think 48, but he looked about 20 years older. I said, yeah. prison can do, prison can do that to you. Yeah. I yeah. interviewed several victims, parents, loved ones. Cause mm. I didn't want to make this piece. I didn't want to make the piece a pity party for yeah. Berkowitz, you know, of course. Yeah. So you got any questions about, I know I read a lot of this, so I actually have more of an up upper hand on you on this one. No, that's fine. I'm really enjoying being yeah. present with him. I, I would probably ask more emotional questions, but uh, why don't you ask a few? Let's 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 see if we can pound away at the outer shell of Matthew I'm Schwartz. Worried about, I'm worried about and that, this. Uh, his battery is going to die exactly when you get to the most. <laughs> this is a, oh, if there's if it, Matthew, if there's only one thing you could tell your kids upon your death, what would that one thing be? You mean I'm going to? And he's that, off. Is that not the best? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. You know, we couldn't have timed that as a better comedy piece. Oh, yes. So that's Matthew Schwartz. Oh, um, he'll probably come back. Well, we'll leave it. Maybe he'll come back. Maybe he won't. What I mean, what I find fascinating is that, you know, when I look at lives, my life or anyone's life, it's almost like if you look at their history, then their life just makes sense. Like if you, if you said a story to me and you'd say, Andy, that's not normal that people do that. And I'd say it's normal for me. And then it's mm. like, oh, of course, that's what my job became. Mm. Like the fact that he wrote an article that outed the people he was living in the same house with and that he accepts that as somehow normal. Yeah. I mean, in order to be able to be at peace with that, it, obviously he's going to become an investigative reporter or uh, a lawyer or something that where you can really be at peace with that level of intensity. I don't even doesn't didn't feel to me that he had to find peace with it. it was like something innate in him this is like this is how it has to be yeah yeah that's almost like there's yeah, no there's well no put. there's no compromise yeah well put i'm back sorry you know we actually were enjoying better we were enjoying talking about you more when you were gone <laughs> so we'll just leave you off to the side and talk about you and oh, then i feel so bad i should have used the the desktop but uh, this is like kind of my setup I, it went from nine to 13 percent. i'm an idiot technically Listen, anyway, oh, I and Matthew, this is overnight, so this is called a wonderful chaos for the very reason that we appreciate and enjoy when it goes really bad. That's sort of our our thing is the worse it goes, the more joy we have. Like we said, God forbid, if ever we start <laughs> having arguments, if it went wrong. Yeah, that would be the worst day. Ever. Like if it went really wrong and we actually started to have a problem, then we got then we got to rethink doing the show. Yeah, the, the, that's the that's so the, the idea is we're just celebrating it. it. Yes. So what? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I was about to go to the emotional question. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. We see that whenever we want to hit Matthew with something that goes just underneath the belt, boom, all yeah. of a sudden he's gone. What, what, what did you ask him? Um, oh, I, yeah. I just asked on to his kids. I just, you know, I was creating some, I, I didn't, I, I don't even know if it was an honest question. I was trying to fabricate a question that yeah. people ask when they are trying to ask more emotional, but they don't. But what we can do now while we're waiting for him to get back on, we might as well use that time to make the announcement of the book cover no. because we're no okay wait to the end let's we'll talk about Matthew end. okay we'll talk it about feels like we're breaking uh, oh good like it, when I when I see him and I look at him as a as a person without actually knowing him or reading his book mm -hmm. he looks tired like that's the thing that like it feels like he squeezed the lemon and juiced even yeah. the, the the skin like like he really got the most out of himself but I feel there's a little bit of a price there. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you were asking before. Yeah. Like, what was the price? 
he might only know that after he retires, you know, when you kind of take your life and say, well, what, what would I have done differently, for instance, right? Well, well he said, uh, I'm an artist worker, like when you want mm. something yeah, and you know you don't have the talent or the skills, then mm -hmm. I'm going to grind. Yeah. Yeah. And we see he's back again. What, what we've decided is, Matthew, we're going to ask you an emotional question. And whenever we do, we're pretty sure that you're going to drop off. That's kind of the, that's what we've Sorry, right I now. apologize to you in the audience, you know. It's it's absolutely no problem. It's, we enjoy it. Please do it again, but make sure it's time to an emotional question next time. <laughs> Bumbus, what would you like to ask, if anything? Hmm. If you would well, turn I back. I can tell you what. My kids, I hope they know that I fought for the little guys and stick up for people who are getting bullied. And, uh, you know. It sounds like that, though. Oh. <laughs> it's now. <laughs> We're going to go in and out, in and out. Okay. Yeah, I was, I was going to ask him, turn back the time, what would you change in your life? Like, I'm wondering if there was anything on that journey where he looks back like, mm. oh, fuck, I shouldn't have done that. I don't, you know, it's interesting. We, we'll ask him, but. I don't imagine that he'd have have a strong one. I, I don't imagine he'd have a strong reaction to that question. You know, I think it would be like, you know, we haven't talked about dad yet, right? We did talk about mom. We didn't talk about dad. Like, in what role did dad play in like creating who he has become? That would also be a, a kind of a fascinating look. Or in, in what way, would, you know, is he like his dad? That would probably be even more fascinating. So why did you prepare for this one? I prepared because I had this idea that Matthew, you know, you see him, right? You're, you're on. I mean, he's pretty exacting. He's like, he, 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 you know, I felt a little bit like he reminds me of when I went to college and I'd have a professor. The professors would always be very exacting, right? You know, you'd use sloppy language. They'd correct it. You know, you, you punctuation wasn't important, but they'd make sure it was. So I had that impression of him from the first time I met him. So I knew he hadn't watched any of our shows. And I thought to myself, he's coming on. He doesn't necessarily know what he's getting himself in for. So that was the reason why I thought, let's make sure that Correct. we, we uh, uh, like, like at least give him some indication. We see Josina Denberger, who's um, um, our, uh, our, our, our great fan. She's asking him a question of, what do you think about these two guys interviewing you? So we'll <laughs> see if we can get him on for that. And by the way, Josina, I believe that this... Uh, Berkowitz, this David, the son of Sam, is still in prison now. So you asked if he was on parole or not. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's basically, I, uh, when I'm sort of interacting with someone that has an expectation, or I believe, let's make that, I make the assumption, has an expectation. And I also could see from the fact that he's been doing this for four decades, he has a certain idea of what television looks like. I actually thought, well, it would be good to prepare where I might not have prepared otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah, because on most of the shows, we don't really prepare, you know. We just sort of wing it, and people think that there, we... There's no... The word really is not even there. We don't prepare, period, Andy. Yeah. But I also have to admit, when I read those first two chapters of his book, I was really fascinated. Because it did get into what I thought were... You know, when he wrote about, you know, the, he, being name-called as a child and his mom going to the other person's house, there was something about that which I thought, wow, like... What is it that these influences have in our life that actually shape and form us later on? Mm. So in, in, in this beautiful way, uh, our parents are an example that we then follow going forward. So when he says, I'm fighting for the little guy, like that's what he wants his kids to know. Yeah. Like that's not all that different than mom fighting for the little guy, being a nurse in the army and all the things that he mentioned before about her. So there is a beauty in that uh, that I see. Yeah. Hmm. Josina keeps writing back with us. He must be fascinated by all these strange people and brave enough to approach them. What is the urge to go and seek these people? That's what we were getting to just a moment ago. Yeah, yeah I think what I what what I think was fascinating from both of us is that when we were talking, it was a bit like you said, and I think you you were you were spot on when you said it. He didn't have to overcome anything. He was just built that way. Yeah. So it's weird when like a, a person is just like, kind of their God-given talent is that, and then they find the job that matches that talent. Mm. And then they, and strangely enough, you'll see even in his case, he's judging himself for it, right? Mm. He's saying, 
I didn't have the right voice. I didn't have the right hair. I didn't have like all the, all the, the itemization of everything that he didn't have. Yeah. yeah. And yet he's been doing it for four decades, right? <laughs> Isn't it crazy? I mean, it's no different than that chapter in the book when I write about me not able, not, not feeling comfortable naming myself as an author. Exactly. You know, it's like, it's like you do something, but you don't feel the confidence to embrace it and say, hey, I am this thing. Yeah. It was actually on our talk, he said that he didn't share the invite for this, this because in it I said TV icon. And he said he, he didn't feel comfortable sharing something that stated him as an icon because he himself didn't feel that way. Right? Yeah, there, there's there like I, I would also feel that resistance if someone would project something onto me, but I'd probably do it because I, I, I feel the resistance. Yeah, I, yeah. exactly. But uh, I found that really quite sweet because in some ways when when we go through life, you know, it took me, of course, as, as you know, from my own story, ages just to celebrate the fact that I was also an author. And in some ways it felt similar for, for him to say, hey, I am, you know, he writes in his book, he writes about some guy called a baseball player called Don Sutton, who was never considered the base, best baseball player, but he was the most consistent over time. Yeah. And so that's the way he said it, like stated, and he said it a little bit in the interview earlier, is that he actually felt that through the consistency over time, that was his greatest strength, right? So consistent, persistent, devotion, devotion. Yeah. Mm. Well, and we have just under nine minutes. I think we can do your book really? cover. Really? You want to do the book cover? If yeah. he comes back in, we can ask. Yeah. Um, the one thing I did announce is that I sent out the poll for the book cover. Um, I sent the poll out. I did that. Um, when did I do that? I did that about a week. Oh, no, four days ago. Yeah. And it was really quite great because uh, there were over 200 and some, I think, 250 responses. Fantastic. Like that's a that's a great response. The the you couldn't see who did it though, right? No, you couldn't. No, and nor did you see the comments. And and basically, the publisher said that that that, that number was even impressive. He said, that, "Yeah, that's a big number to get in such a short period of time." And as we looked at, it, it's kind of funny. There's a really fascinating thing about book covers. Can I put it on? Yeah, please go ahead. Um, the the fascinating thing about book covers is that once you like get a book cover, it's often um it's often about what does that cover incite what's the emotional response what is a trigger in the in the in the viewer and uh and i noticed not you know how i always talk about the left side brain and the right side brain and there's kind of and i know that that's an oversimplification i've told I've been told about it over and over again by anyone who really understands the brain functioning but the left side brain is the more literal the one that's basically says hey uh like like I need to understand this, and the right side is the more creative. It's the more I want to. Exp I, I'm, I'm free in the creativity, right? That's the overgeneralization yeah. of this. Um, and basically, so the left one is far more. If we look at the the screen, right, the left one is far more saying, "Hey, this is a journey, right? A journey." Obviously, there's a bright idea. There was some act of love that had something to do with the car on this road, where it says a journey in radical self love. And then the camera with the hearts and so on. So this one communicates more of the journey aspect of it, right? Yeah. Which, you know, everyone knows I was on the road for three months sitting with 60 groups. So that was that aspect. This one is far more of the practice of radical self-love, right? So the wounded healer being a journey in radical self-love. So in this one, the idea was this is more of a self-help book. Like you would look at that book and say, hey, at least this is my interpretation. Yeah. This is more like, oh yeah, I could buy that as a self-help book. Clearly there's something in there. So the question really came down to, am I going to position it more as a journey or am I going to position it more as a self-help? And then comes in everyone in an opinion because <laughs> it's very infrequent that somebody just says, I like this one better than that one. It does happen on occasion. Usually it's the other one sucks. <laughs> so that's how that's how motivated or inspired people are usually when they look at a cover. They say, the other one sucks. <laughs> 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 so you're like, now you're like, you almost feel like, do I have to offend them? Like, do I have to now offend them in order for this to work? Like, do I have to say, hey, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I chose that one. Right. Yeah. And so then it comes down to, in this case, I got the most consistent feedback for one cover from everyone that was closest to the project. So not the 
So the, the ones closest, so when I say closest, my wife, my wife's sister, the first editor of the book, the second editor of the book, the publisher. So each one of them came on one side of this divide. I think you came on the same side of that divide, actually. Which one was it, Andy? And so I'm just building it up, Bambo. So I know, this, I know. Is it too much? I'm like, get, get on with it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so the drum, left. Drum roll. Or the right. The left or the right? Right. It was the left, Bambos. Really? It was the left. The left oh, one got wow. it. Well, 142 votes. 55% of the votes went to the left side, to I, the road. I, I picked the right. You picked the right? Oh, yeah. did you? Oh, that's why you're pushing for the right. I was pushing for the I mean, right. I do find the right beautiful, I have to say. I mean, I really loved the, the, uh, the beauty of it. It felt more beautiful. Yeah. Um, but the left was was getting a lot of the journey aspect into it and the fact that there's going to be 20 articles that are going to be on Buzzworthy from this book and there's going to be a journey part of that meant there's sort of an alignment. And if and if you look at the new web page, andychaleff.com, andychaleff.com is very much in line with both of them actually, but that's kind of the left side is very much more of the the raw, the uh, the the unappealing. You know, I'm not very refined. Andy, the life. left side sucks. Don't Good. do it. <laughs> I love it. Left side sucks. Don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Sorry, Bambus. Well, I'll give you a book with just the right side for you. I'll get one printed just for you. I, so. Yeah, I already have a book. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. Thank Congra you. Congratulations, Andy. Thank you. Thank I'm you. I'm really uh, proud of you. Yeah. Yeah, I'm proud of me as well. I am uh, excited that I uh, was able to kind of get it this far. The advanced reader copy it's called the arc will be available uh in the next two or three days and then i'll start going and uh be even been to some bookstores in amsterdam that are going to be holding it so this is a fun journey nice and uh buzzworthy is going to run a, a 20 different pieces from it over a three-month period yeah. can you imagine that <sighs> the archetypes of all the people that were having struggle with reclaiming the self-love and we're going to highlight each one of those archetypes over a long period. So there's a lot of good stuff coming in on that. Yeah. So we we lost Matthew Schwartz. We lost him, uh, I guess, five, 10 minutes ago. But I believe that it was great. Uh, Experience. The, the time we had him was just great. You know, necessarily, I, there might have been more questions we might have asked. But well, I hope he doesn't feel bad because he, 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 he looks like I show up, I take it seriously. Yeah. He yeah. Does, yeah he, he doesn't understand that we are actually celebrating what happened. So yeah. I'll let him know. You know, I can't use my bad humor because my joy would be to say to him, you really screwed it up. I don't know what we're going to do with that show now. <laughs> don't do that. No, no. I, okay. Um, what we can do is I'd love to just do a quick recap of the shows this week because I, I did the video. I did the other one, but yeah. I'd love this because we got some really good shows coming up this week. Uh, tomorrow, we got Surrendering to Life, and that's at 5 p.m. And I think we're probably going to get into Love and Lust in that one because you've been all about Love and Lust lately. So I think surrendering to life in the context of love and lust might be where we go on that. Yeah, let's see. Okay. Uh, Tuesday, we have the reality behind reality TV with cameraman that's done 100 reality TV shows. And he says, basically, they're all full of a lot of BS. And he's going to expose a lot of what they actually do to make people appear to be dumber than they are. On Wednesday at 5. We're excited about Wednesday. Wednesday, we've got Laser 3.14. If you live in Amsterdam, you know Laser. Laser tags everything. I put something improper in our announcement, I had to change it. I said he was a prophet because that's the way I see him as a prophet. And he said, Andy, I'm not a prophet. I'm a street artist that does poetry. So I changed it. You may have noticed that or not. I'm not sure. Beautiful. That's on Wednesday at 5 p.m. And on Thursday at 6 p.m., we have hundreds of divorces with Denise Light. Now, she's done hundreds of divorces over 30 years. I just think that's fascinating. <laughs> Like the worst part of anyone's life. Like, think about it. I, I think she would love Yosina. <laughs> <laughs> we had the woman who's married 3,000 people and the woman that's divorced hundreds of them. I think they <laughs> should have coffee. <laughs> <laughs> we should have both of them on, the on either end. Um, and then on Friday, we have uh, David Wilson Johnson, who's the words, world's, worst, world's, world's most sought after baritone opera singer. He's done over 40 albums. He actually performed for 340 million people on one show after 9-11. So he's really uh, uh, an, just an incredible man and yeah. fun as hell. I'm really impressed by the caliber of guests that we're having on our, on our show. Yeah, we get some incredible guests on the show. This is our 36th edition. This is our 36th. Can you imagine we made it this far? 
yes, we got, we got, I mean, I think we're all booked out to like end of July. So we've got a lot going on, Bam. Yeah. So Thanks, and thank you. Um, have, a, have a beautiful evening. Have guys. a beautiful evening and we'll see you the rest of the week on a wonderful chaos. Yeah. Bye.